Uh, and it's what a lot of us start on as well. So it'd be good for us to kind of, you know, look at different ways we can make economics fun and engaging when we go back in September. So I'm going to look at a, a game called the Zoo Game, uh, which uh, looks at the idea of scarcity and explaining scarcity to students, uh, looking at opportunity costs. We'll look at some activities to introduce factors of production, and I mean introducing there as well. We're going to look at a game that we can use to explain the production possibility curves to students as well. And then we're going to look at uh, the circular economy, or basically a sustainability activity, um, which will bring in the whole, and I think we're all very familiar with the whole idea of the sustainable stuff from the uh, research project. So we can incorporate that in from the start, get the students thinking about that. And I'm going to show you some links to some other resources that are there as well. And uh, there's, as you know, yourself, there's loads and loads of stuff on the, on the internet. So just some, some interesting foot, uh, links that I like to use to take the, for keeping stuff current in our economics lessons as it were. So the very first activity that we're going to look at today is what I call building a zoo. Oh, okay. Uh, and the, there's, this is a great uh, little activity uh, to get some working in groups. So there's two ways you can do this. You can either do this in groups or you can actually send them home to do this as a homework task. But I think doing it in class and doing groups is a much, much more engaging and fun way of doing it. So basically what your group, or you can do this in pairs or because it's COVID, you can get them to do it individually as well. Um, you're going to get them to build a zoo. So they have to decide what animals they're going to have in their zoo, except the problem is space is limited. They can't have everything they want. So uh, they only have 25 acres in this little zoo. So how does it work? Basically, there's a list of uh, animals there, as you hopefully see on the screen there now, and each of them have a certain amount of space. Okay, so for example, the lion will take up two acres, uh, whereas a turkey will only take up a tenth of an acre, an Asian elephant will take up an acre, but an African elephant takes up one half, an, uh, sorry, an acre and a half. Now, the fun part about this is that, with the exception of the house of birds, um, the, you cannot have just one animal. You need to have the animals in pairs. Okay, uh, why? So the zoo can be sustainable and keep itself going, and that usually gets a bit of a giggle to some of our more the more mature students in the room. And um, so, how does it look? So the students are going to get a lovely sheet of paper like this, which is lovely and complex to develop. It's literally a table. Uh, of 25 squares, five by five. Uh, and I have down here at the bottom all the different animals. So this, uh, which you know, reminds them what each of them are. So as a demonstration uh, to show you just to get started, so you're very clear. So just each box is equal to an acre. So we have there a little tiger there. Okay, so we have two tigers arriving in there now. A tiger takes up one animal each, sorry, one acre each. So there's two acres filled in my zoo already. Remember, I have to have two tigers because uh, we need to have have two of each animal uh, as part of the stock. Okay. Next up, we're getting in some elephants. Okay. And uh, the question is, which type of elephant do I go for? The African elephant or the Asian elephant? Hopefully, no one here knows the actual difference and be able to tell me which one's which. They're just two random elephants there. But we pick two Asian elephants there for this one. Why? Because they only take an acre each as opposed to an acre and a half, which the African elephant does. Here we've got two seals. Two seals are taking up half an acre each. So therefore they fill up one acre nice and easy. Uh, next in our zoo, now don't worry, I'm not gonna look the full thing, don't worry, I'll, I'll stop after the next one. I have two camels, which make up half an, acre, half an acre of each camel, so that makes it And then last but not least, um, I've got two monkeys, okay? And the second monkey always takes painstakingly long to appear, as you can see it rolling in there now. So monkeys take up half an acre each. So now at this stage, I've seven of my acres um, filled up. So I've 18 more to fill up. Uh, as you can imagine, I can't have everything that's on that initial list. So the students are going to have to make choices. So usually I give them about five minutes to have, play around and actually figure out what they're going to actually put in their zoo or not. Now, you can stretch this out to being a full class if you want to get them all to present their zoos to the class and talk about why they picked out the different things but um and you'll always have some people that go oh i had a zoo, a zoo of just turkeys uh thinking they're hilarious um and that's okay for the uh, for the moment uh because usually you have one master group and most of the groups will take it quite seriously but now that you've got all of them have their zoos written out this is where the fun well i say the fun bit the fun bit for us that was the fun bit for them but this is the fun bit for us as teachers as they say um, next up, we're going to look at the idea of the class discussion, and we actually get the learning side out of it. Okay, so we ask uh, to use Education Speak higher and lower order questions here, uh, or basically just ask them questions based on what they've just learned, so they can identify the actual learning that they've done. So here's some prompt questions I've put in there. Uh, so, for example, why didn't we put one of every animal into the zoo? Okay. Um, the, and this will click, yes. What animal did you leave out of your zoo? Um, what ones did you put in and why did you choose those specific animals? Uh, 
Um, why don't uh, did you not have a zoo with only monkeys in it, for example? Although generally speaking, you'll find there's always one group will always decide to be clowns and put those in. Okay. Uh, why did you choose the Asian elephant and not an African elephant? The reason being, generally speaking, is that the I think yeah, the Asian elephant is only an acre, whereas the African elephant is an acre and a half, so it's taking up more space, and you wouldn't get as much into your zoo. What was the last animal to make it into the zoo? And there you're introducing the concept of opportunity cost, which you may or may not have already thought, but it's a nice introduction way to bring it in uh, for them to be able to identify and ask what is the, la uh, the animal that missed out on getting into the zoo? Now, generally, as the class discussion goes, there's lots of other concepts you're able to bring in. And you don't have to follow, like, they're just prompt questions are just made up for the purpose of this. Uh, but generally speaking, it flows in itself. And you're building the idea, the bottom line of this activity is you're building in the concept and idea that, you know, you can't have everything you want uh, because of scarce resources, we have to make choices, okay? So it can be a nice, fun activity uh, to introduce that. And the great thing about that as well, because if you're doing that at the start of fifth year with your economics class, uh, it can be a nice icebreaker as well. If the students, you know, uh, to be fair, at fifth year, all students know each other. But in case there's some new people from the uh, from different schools, whatever, it can be a nice way to break them in. And maybe in that class dynamic, they might not already know each other because, you know, first time in a class together. So it can be a nice uh, way of a bit of a, an icebreaker for that. Now on to our next one, okay? Uh, this is the opportunity cost activity. And this is a very, very short, simple and sweet activity, okay? And to be honest with you, this is really more aimed if you're uh, in a school that use one-to-one -one devices, this is a very handy and easy one, okay? So I'm going to click this link and fingers crossed, this is gonna bring me onto a web page. Uh, and look, you can see all my wonderful tabs open there. Please, can you just give me a thumbs up? Is that for, yeah, that's excellent. That's what I'd like to see. Okay, so this is a super, super duper complex game. In fact, I'm gonna play with you here now. It's a whopping five questions long, okay? Uh, and basically you have to identify which one is the opportunity cost, okay? So I'm gonna press play here now and it's telling me you buy hot Cheetos instead of tackies. Which one is the opportunity cost? So I've got five options here. You can see yourself, I'm running out of time here. So I'm going to click tackies. Oh my God, yay, I got it right. Haven't I amazing? Matt runs one mile instead of lifting weights. What's the opportunity cost? Well, lifting weights and getting stronger. There we go. You go to work after school. And I'm going to get this one wrong instead. I'm going to say the football game just for the argument. So you can see yourself, oh, oh, I've got it wrong. Okay. Uh, I have another chance. I go to work after school. Yep. Yeah, uh, my free time after school. Okay. Um, then you study for your test instead of going to the football game. Well, the football game, obviously. And there we go. I've had my five chances and I was really close. I got 80% right. Um, now, this is a great thing. You can time it there and you have a bit of a competition going with the class. Who was able to get it the quickest? You know, now there's the option to register. Wouldn't bother, wouldn't go there. Not worth it. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not required. It's a nice, fun little activity. Now, as I say, it takes a couple of seconds, it's a few minutes. And if you do one to one, so what I mean by one to one, if you guys are using iPads in your class, like if your students have their own iPads or Surface Goes or Chromebooks, depending on what school you're in, and they're using them instead of textbooks, this can be a very, very handy way of doing that. Okay. Now I have to figure out a way of getting used back to the screen. Excellent. I, I hopefully you're all back on the PowerPoint. Brilliant. Okay. So it's a nice little interactive way of bringing the, as I say, um, opportunity cost in. Now, facts of production. And um, as we know, we're going to, uh, to be clear what I'm doing with the facts of production at this part here, okay, is that I am doing this uh, as literally a very, very basic introduction. When I'm teaching strand one to the students at the start of the year, um, I'm literally just, you know, skip, skipping over and basically giving them a very general introduction to what economics and what economics is about. So this is scarcity, this is opportunity cost. At this stage of facts of production, it's very much junior cycle what I'm teaching them, what the four facts of production are really. And um, that's pretty much what I'm at. Okay, so if I can, no, that's not working. Here we go. So what I do here in this space is a little bit of a matching card exercise. So I've taught them what the, you know, four facts of production are, land, labor, capital, enterprise. Thanks very much. And now I give each group an envelope and they take out their envelope and I start my little countdown timer and they've got 60 seconds on the clock to organize uh, the cards in there into the four different various factors of production. Uh, I'm not gonna wait for that countdown timer to go down. Now, here we go. Here is a list of different examples of the cards that I've included. I screenshot them all and put them into this. But what I'll do is um, I'll put, uh, I'll make this available to Lisa, the, the actual card there, if anyone's just to print them off, because book themselves. I made these years ago, print them off, laminate them, put them in the envelopes. I've had to replace maybe one or two of the physical envelope because the students got hungry and started nibbling at it or ripping it apart or something like that. 
God knows what happens. But anyway, um, the actual physical cards themselves are laminated, they've lasted. So once you make them, yeah, it's a bit of stress and effort, but once you have them, they'll last you forever, you know? Um, but you can see yourself the, uh, the way I've laid them out there. Uh, now, naturally enough, they're in somewhat of an order there, but I've got my land ones here, okay? Uh, naturally enough, they're all completely jumbled up in the... Um, in the envelope, as you'd imagine. You've got your labor here, okay? You've got your bits of capital, and then you've got your enterprise examples there as well. And of course, you can add in your own ones and you know change it up around and stuff. But the idea gets them the idea of categorizing them. Now, it's a short, rapid fire activity, okay? So you might think to yourself, it's a lot of work and effort for 60 seconds, but this way you're really tying in your AFL as well, since you can really see if the students get it or not. Uh, very quickly you're getting them working with others as well which is another one of the senior cycle key skills as well so you're getting in a lot of the different uh, bits and pieces with this as well and it's a bit of fun it can break up the monotony of you know going through a powerpoint or reading the book or the general kind of stuff that we end up doing it's you know nice and quick the key thing with this though is that if you leave them at too long okay 60 seconds is more than enough time in fact if you really want to challenge them get them to do it in 30 seconds and what i like doing with that as well googling <clears throat> excuse me uh, Google, you know the, you know the, you know the game uh, countdown. Um, you know, you know everyone knows countdown. If you don't, Google it. You know, great, great program. Um, but uh, use the countdown clock uh, timer. Okay, um, the thirty, it's a thirty second countdown timer, and see if they can get it done with that. And that adds a bit of you know uh, fun to it as well. Uh, if you leave them too long on it, uh, then they get bored of it because they have it done. They end up having the chats and they start talking about what they're watching on Netflix last night or what the latest trend on TikTok is or God knows what it is. It's some meaningless dribble that isn't economics anyway and you've lost it, you know? So that's one of two activities that I often do. Sorry, you did not need to see all my notifications. Um, then I move on to my next activity, um, which is a factors production where I get them to actually make sure they apply it, um, where I give them now, I've just listed five random businesses there. Sometimes I might get our organizations there. I might get them to come up with their own, okay? But I usually give them about two minutes to list out all the factors of production they can um, for each of those different organizations. Each group gets a different one. And uh, then they present them back to the, to the class as a whole. Okay, um, so there's some fun little easygoing activities to get the students thinking uh, to make them aware of what they're at. Okay, so that's some facts of production stuff there. And I say now, as you know yourself, facts of production is done later on in the course in more detail, but it's more to get them into the idea that they're aware these are the four facts of production, these are the key ingredients in terms of making businesses happen, so to speak. Okay, so say to yourself, because you know yourself, some students that are coming in doing economics, depending on the school, they may not have a, a, had done junior cycle business. So it's a quick rapid fire just to try and bring them all up to speed quickly whilst making sure they all have a uh, baseline knowledge. Now, the next one is interesting, um, and I'm just going to pause for a quick sip of water. And now, I'm going to talk about the production possibility curves, or production possibility frontiers, as you may uh, look at it. Now, um, the, this is something new in the sense that we would not have taught this in the old course, okay? Um, it is not specifically it's explicitly uh, screaming out on the specification, although it is implied in several parts of the specification. Um, and as you know, specification, we don't have a real depth of uh, learning on it. So um, considering that it is taught in pretty much every other um, secondary school or post-primary school program around, uh, you know, uh, it's an A level, it's an IB, it's in the AP program, and um, especially in the updated specifications of services around the world, uh, one would be safe to assume that this is more than likely expected to be known. And it's a very, even if not, uh, it's a very important concept for the students to be aware of. And this game makes it very, very relevant and easy for them to understand. Okay, so this involves a game basically involves students playing a production game and creating their own production possibility frontiers or production possibility curve curves. I love the way I did PPC curves it's twice. Brilliant. Where I got this, I didn't make this up myself, by the way, don't worry. Um, and I should actually mention, by the way, to give credit where credit's due, that zoo game I got on the internet years ago. I have no idea where I got it from. Um, I tried to fi uh, figure out where I'd give credit to say it's a so. I'm sorry to the original owner or creator of that game. I'm not giving you fair credit. I have no idea who you are, but it's a great game. Fair play to you. Um, the, this was developed by uh, Swansea University and uh, full information on this is available at economicsnetwork.ac.uk, where there is a wide range of fun, different games and experiments you can do in your economics classroom. Um, so for any of that are uh, looking blindly going, oh, I remember doing production possibility curves in that lecture, I definitely 
didn't go to in first year uni. Um, this is just a quick recap of what one looks like. Okay, uh, in our fake little economy here, you're producing two goods: or producing uh, guns and or butter. Okay, if the firm is uh, sorry, if the country is operating here, they are only making guns and making zero butter. And at this point here, they're making only butter and zero guns. But in reality, they're probably going to make a combination of each. So assuming that they're employing all the resources in the country, they're going to be operating along this blue line here. So for example, at the point B, they're producing lots of guns and not much butter. At the point D, they're producing roughly half and half at each. And at the point C, they're producing lots of butter and not many guns. At point A, they there, it means they're not producing at their full capacity. In other words, they're inefficient. Uh, and at point X, something's mental has gone wild because they're operating beyond their possibilities. Um, so production making beyond their possibility. Um, so they're, you, they've managed to find extra resources somehow, some way. Either way, they're doing really well and that's quite unusual. So obviously there's some sort of an injection into the economy at this point here. As a quick recap, so you've, uh, in case you might have forgotten or may not be familiar with the concept, or maybe you have, well, haven't been teaching a new course yet. So uh, just to bring you up to speed so you have an idea what this game is about. There is lots of materials required for this game. It's uh, not really. You need tennis balls, so you need to go down to the PE department and um, sweet talk them into giving you uh, lots of tennis balls. You need paper, so you need to go and rob the station room or the photocopier. And I say buckets, boxes, containers, something to just hold the tennis balls and or paper in after, okay? The lid, if you're stuck, the lids, the photocopying paper boxes are very handy for this, or even just the actual boxes of the photocopying paper as well, they work too. So those are the things you need for this game. Now, how does this game work? How do we actually get it into things? So in our imagined economy, there's only two goods. We're gonna say tennis balls and paper. Okay, if you want to be fancy on this, you can call them different things. So you can pretend the tennis balls are food and the paper is closed, for example, or if you want to go fancy on that, but keep it simple, tennis balls and paper. Okay, now I'm saying there's 10 workers in total. Okay, mix it up to however's in your class. So um, I wouldn't recommend probably having any more than 10 um, operating at once. If you do, if you need more than 10, run two games concurrently on either side of your classroom, basically is the way I do it. Um, but like, let's say if you have 16 in your class, have two groups of eight, if you get one from one. But any more than 10, it just gets messy, to be honest with you, in one particular line, okay? Uh, as I've said in the next bullet point, I've already said that large groups can have two spaces going at once, okay? So basically, what do we do? The, place the tennis, so um, if you can imagine, I'm going to explain one game, but you can have two groups playing this game at the same time, or three groups if you've got, say, 24 in your class and you want to have three goes of eight. OK, um, so the tennis balls and the paper are placed into separate raw material containers in the middle of the room is what we're calling. Them, OK, containers is a generic word for your box, basket, bucket, whatever. OK, so in the middle of the room, you've got your raw materials, i.e. your paper and your tennis balls. OK, on then on either side of the room, OK, you've got your finished goods or your empty containers. One, so let's say tennis balls on this side of the room and paper on the far side of the room. Okay, a unit, as we call it, is produced when a ball is moved, a ball or a piece of paper is moved from the raw material container to the finished good container. Okay, uh, the students must stand in a production line and pass the balls or the paper along the line. Okay, and um, what I sometimes do to make it a bit more challenging, I get them to make the pit turn the paper into paper balls. So not just passing a sheet of paper, they have to take the paper, scrub it up into a ball and pass it along. But I was advised by students once, that's not very environmentally friendly, sir, because we can't reuse this paper. So um, if you want to be more environmental conscious, they just then don't do that and the paper can be uh, reused for printing after. Anyway, the students will stand in production line and pass the ball, uh, their ball or paper along the line. Uh, every student that's in the group must hold the ball, each ball or page at some point from the purpose, uh, from the, where it's going from raw materials to the finished good, but they can only hold one ball at a time, okay? Um, now, for this to work, do you have to have make sure that things are actually, you know, a fair bit apart, that they're not all glued together, okay? Try to ensure that when all the students are on one side, they can only just reach to pass the balls or pages to get uh, to each other, okay? Um, so, Continue on. So the way you split these up, you do it into sessions. So the way it is, keep it, keep it fast and focused, okay? So make each session the same length of time, okay? 30 seconds is a lovely, nice bit of time because it keeps them, you know, working as hard as they can, as quick as they can, okay? In the first session, students should only work on one type of good, okay? So you get them to either only focus their other efforts on uh, tennis balls or on paper, um, okay? In the second session then, they should work 
only on the other goods. So if they pick tennis balls the first time, then the second time get them only to work on paper. Okay, then every session you do after this, and they do say three, four, or five different sessions of this, get them to do a mix of each. Now, if they're not very imaginative on it, okay, or if you see the things that they're doing the same thing each time, give them a bit of a challenge. So say, for example, okay, this time try to do twice as many tennis balls as paper, for example, because the idea is this, is we're going to get them to actually take their data of output and sketch their own production possibilities curve. Okay, so each time, do I have this on the next slide? Um, Oh yeah, so uh, as they put them into each of the, uh, so as to get them to the finished product box as it were, or container, um, that is their, um, that is their finished product when the timer stops, you count up all their um, units produced and you record, you can record it on the board. Uh, or get them recorded themselves, okay? And at the end then, you can use all this data to actually sketch out their own production possibility curve. And hopefully then you get a curve, now obviously it's not gonna be a perfect curve, but they'll be able to visually see what it looks like, okay? Um, now, the rules for the game to make clear from the start, as we said, only one, a student can only be holding one good, i.e. one tennis ball or one piece of paper at a time. There's to be no running allowed, which, you know, makes sense and you're not allowed to throw any of the goods either okay and this keeps it consistent okay because at the end of the day at this point you want to be making clear that there's the same amount of resources in other words the same amount of labor i.e amount of people each time okay now if you want to add this up and make this a bit more uh, interesting as it were okay you can take people out of the group okay um, and say for example you know to show that they're not using all the resources they're going to operate within the production possibilities curve or what you can do, for example, is that you can let them use, say, have two items in their hands at once, okay? That will obviously speed things up and that'll show that they're operating outside the production possibility curve. So from that, they'll be able to see what it is. So basically they can see that with the certain amount of resources, they can produce a combination of goods uh, at any stage, okay? And that should be able to visually show them what it's like in practice, okay? So um, I'm gonna just pause for a quick moment there and just see, uh, is there any questions in the Q&A um, uh, stuff so far? Just yeah. to pick so we have two questions in, uh, well, there was more questions, but I've answered them. Um, so one here is, hi, James, we're introducing Leaving Cert Economics for the first time in September. Any advice and support would be great. Perfect, okay, very well. Uh, first, you uh, have very, very best of luck uh, introducing it, fair play to you. Um, in my last school, I actually introduced economics for the first time there as well. Uh, it was the first time in school, it was in school in over 20 years or so. Um, I would say um, from the outset, don't get too bogged down in strand one at the start. So give them, a, 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 I'm not sure in your school whether they've all done junior cycle business or not, but the main thing is you want to have them all to have a, a general understanding of the key concepts. Um, you know, for example, what is scarcity, what is opportunity cost, what is a resource, okay, and then get stuck into your strand two, which is an into your demand, okay, you could spend months dilly dallying on the stuff about um, the concepts in strand one, but you want to get them all just to a very simple level where they all understand some key terms, and then you're moving straight on. Okay. Second question there, we're seeing on the more detailed facts of production section of the course, the learning outcomes are very labor focused. Is there much need to over, uh, cover the other three factors in much detail? Um, that's, that's a great question. I am, we, I don't have any crystal ball in that sense to know about that. And I, I think just to be very clear in the sense, at this point of the course, at the beginning of strand one, I'm just introducing the four facts of production. So I'm not going to detail the labor stuff. So I'm waiting to get to that part of the course to do that properly. It's more that they're aware these are here so they can tie that knowledge in throughout the rest. Um, I would take from what you're saying though, I mean to, to um, the other specification here beside me in case it was the old question. Uh, of course, I do I remember which one the factor of production is. No, not at all. You know, um, the here it is there, 3.2. I mean, it is very labor focused. So I would take from that to be obviously doing, you do more in labor. I did basically, I did more in labor. You know what I mean? I would still cover the other ones. And I think we have to wait for a paper two to really see what they're looking for. Um, so I wouldn't not cover them. Um, but I don't think in as much detail, I think you're right in saying that there is more of a focus on the labor. But at the same time, you know, I, I wouldn't skip over them. Okay. 
Thanks, James. That's great. The other questions that came in were just, is it being recorded? And um, I actually forgot to press record until they reminded me. So thank you. Yes. Uh, so it will be recorded and it'll be up on the BSTI YouTube channel, along with all the other webinars in a couple of days. Uh, the second question was, will these notes be available so they can get access to the links and stuff like that? And, and James said um, that he would share them with me. And uh, I, Rachel has the list of attendees, so she will forward it to them maybe tomorrow or the next day. Uh, whenever she gets a chance and i think that was all of the questions well, 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 yes. um, you yeah. have to reply the i was going to say um yeah I, i'll do i'll send stuff on to you on friday probably lisa uh realistic perfect and then, yeah then, take your time yeah yeah, yeah. so don't be because there's something else on tomorrow so don't be i don't want to get your hopes all up and they're going they're not there and just refreshing the page it's just not happening <laughs> no email is coming the other thing to say as well is i've put just for those of you that came in i have put the link to the google doc um for the search of attendance for this evening up um in the chat function if you want to check it out there and i'll share it again a couple of times throughout the night just in case um you need to get it perfect there you go jane excellent okay uh, so it's a nice breaker so the next thing i want to show you now is the um a sustainability activity okay We're, we are absolutely flying through this actually uh just a quick one on that production possibility curve game that is a starter point inside that type of game that game can be adapted for several other different um concepts that we'll do throughout the course and possibly in uh, we'll do other sessions as say today we're focusing very much on strand one but we may do other sessions in the future where we look at the other strands in the course throughout the next year or two um, and different activities can do to you for strand two and strand three and so on and so forth. Um, but that game can be very easily adapted for, um, you know, teaching things like absolute advantage, comparative advantage and stuff as well. And um, so there's a lot of different production games you can use from that. Um, there's a great resource called ten uh, Tennis Ball Economics, by the way. Um, loads of stuff on basically how you can use tennis balls to teach very simple economic concepts they're great okay now the next thing is sustainability okay sustainability is something that we may not have really looked at in economics and um, well we always looked at it but we may not have given it the due care and attention that it was fully deserved of until this year when we got that lovely leaving search um report where we had to throw in a bit of sustainability into it okay and as we know it's all it, as we know it's there in 1.3 quite clearly and i think it's important that um the key thing with the with the strand is that it's been taught the whole time throughout and um, that it's we're embedding that strand into all the areas of the course so we're not teaching it completely in isolation that we're showing how it incorporates in the different parts so with that knowledge now i think we've seen that now with the um with the report uh, with the research report that we have to do that we want to introduce sustainability at the start of fifth year, so the students know what it is, and then we're looking for opportunities throughout the course to show them what it's like. Okay. Now, the problem with sustainability um, is that it's a bottomless pit. Okay. You could get, you could literally dive into a hole and spend weeks upon weeks learning so much about it, learning about sustainable development goals. There's so many different projects and different activities and whatnot you can do on that. Okay. So the resource I'm going to show you, uh, the first resource I'm going to show you today, okay, uh, is a Google developed resource. Okay. Uh, which is hopefully opening up on your screen here now. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you through this isn't, um, this is the type of class if you have devices or a computer room in your school, you could book it out for a class for this. Okay, um, and this is kind of very much it's open ended and it's a kind of um, it isn't strictly economics in that sense, there is an economics twist to it, but it's not pure economics, but it's getting the idea um, into the idea the students head of are very much focusing on the concept of resources here, limited resources and scarcity and the choices that we're making. Okay, so I'm going to go through one small part of it with you. There's four, there's uh, three or four parts. I think there's three or four parts, four parts. There we go. See, if I just stall for time a little longer, I would remember that, okay? So uh, the concept is, uh, that we're looking here is the circular economy, okay? And basically the idea, um, the, the, uh, one thing is fast fashion, and that's very popular and trendy with the students, so to speak, okay? But they divide into four main sections, and I'd encourage the class to go through each of them in a guided way, okay? I'm just gonna show you one of them there now. We'll go with stuff because we all love stuff. Who doesn't like a bit of stuff? Okay, um, so um, we learned there's some different lovely lists of random facts, and this is somewhat self guided here as well. Okay, so since 2000, manufacturing low quality qu uh, clothing quickly to meet fashion cycles has been on the rise, whereas the cost of clothing has decreased. Uh, let's discover the cost the price is paying. So it's already we're looking at the idea of whilst we might be getting our goods cheap, 
the environment is paying the cost. So someone is always paying the cost. There's, there's lots of discussion points you can take off this as well. And you can see here, there's lots of questions here that, you know, guess questions. So um, guess, oh, I actually know these answers already and can't really throw them out to you, okay? Well, I'll see if I remember them. I shouldn't have said that actually. So guess the number of clothes is produced every single year across the globe. I'm gonna say it's a hundred billion and what a genius am I? Okay, it is indeed a hundred billion. Um, so there's a few little different uh, questions like that, okay? I'm just going to click through these very quickly um, just so you kind of get the idea um, what it is so you can see what the students would be looking at. But there's lots of basically, each of these different things can have discussion points off it, okay? Um, so just clicking through each time. Uh, fun facts, and you see, see like see we've got these facts here, okay? Um, that you can have discussions on these, and what's the economic effect in these, and you can be discussing these different types of concepts. There's lots of lots of really really good things you can talk about here, okay? Um, you collect little tips when you as you go through this uh, thing as it were, which is wonderful, I suppose. Um, not really the the key part of the lesson or the focus at all. Now, here we go to the wardrobe idea and um, where I'm going to have to click on each piece of clothing on it. Um, so let's here, I'm going to pick this and it's going to tell me uh, different ways I can act more sustainably. So the zip's broken, I can repair it instead of closing it out. Um, the shoes, I could sell them on to someone else. There's lots of different um, things here in this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip this just so that we're saving a bit of time. So there we go. Uh, I could become a circular champion where, hey, I'm a, I'm a die great. But there's really, uh, this is a really good fun class. And generally you'll find there's a few people in the class that are big into the environment. Um, in every class I've had, there has been anyway. Um, and that really gets the discussion going. And it becomes a very environmental class, but you're keeping the focus on the economic side of it the whole time and getting into really focusing the concept of, you know, this is how we're using our resources. And just because we, the consumer, are getting the goods cheaper, there's enough extra cost here as well. Now, you also could bring in as well, and um, I'm jumping ahead here ever so slightly, but the concept of market failure, which is, again, new on this course as well. But you bring the idea of an externality, okay? So you're not, this is something you'll be bringing back in later, but this just have in the back of your head that you can be tying back this into this later uh, when you come to teach this point, this topic at that point. Okay, so um, there's this lovely idea of making a pledge that you're going to be more environmentally aware, it's uh, and more sustainable, sorry, etc. And you can see I've unlocked some mini tips there. Isn't that brilliant? I didn't do any of them. I've made zero pledges because I'm a horrible person. I've collected four out of my 12 tips. I can make lots of different pledge. Um, I could sign in to save my progress, but I'm absolutely not. I can click on the other ones here as well. These are back to my other four sections there as well. Okay, so that gives you a general idea. So that's a really, really good, fun resource. You'll get a double class out of that, no bother at all. Um, like it's, it's genuinely absolutely fantastic. Okay, uh, and it really sets the scene for the sustainability section now. The only downside is it doesn't look into the sustainable development goals. So I would recommend doing a class on the sustainable development goals thereafter. But that can be a nice little homework project group task as well, where you split the class into groups, give them a sustainable development goal to look at, and get you make them aware that it's there. Okay, and get them to find out a bit about it. Okay, and that's all I spend on sustainability. Okay two doubles max, and then you've got them a foundation so they know what it's about. And then you, as you're teaching the content of the rest of the course, you're incorporating it throughout, okay? Now, just this article here, okay, about the circular economy, okay? To give you an idea of what that's about, okay? And it's kind of what the idea of that Google resource is about is a circular economy. If you have a class that's really into it and you're really into it and you can afford to spend a class or two, you know, delving into this, um, you can, there is, and this, uh, it's, the website's on the link that you're all going to get here, but there is lots of really fun, interesting stuff here on this website that I'm flicking through and hopefully it's loading up on your page um, and you can actually see it. That's perfect. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, and there's different videos and stuff there um, that you can do or the students can do and explore and have a look at there as well. Okay. So that's how I would recommend or suggest incorporating sustainability at the beginning, but as I say, sustainability should be taught throughout, as should all the various different parts of the course. Uh, sorry, of strand one be taught throughout the course and not at the st stop, at the, at the beginning or the end, and that's it. Now, where are we at? Okay, so some other useful resources to show you there then as well, okay? So as I say, that, that's a whistle stop to talk the whistle stop tour through some of the different activities that we can do in strand one. There's lots of other activities that we can do in each of the different strands throughout the course uh, as well that we look that we look at 
next year, maybe, or future tense, okay? Um, the, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you three different resources uh, links here now, which have various different lesson plans and activities, okay? Now this first one, okay, uh, is basically, has lots of different lesson plans, and some of the stuff is beyond the scope of the Leaving Cert course, just to be aware of that, okay? Uh, and that's one thing to be aware of with some of these different links, okay, is that, other economics programs, uh, A-levels, IB, AP program, in, AP in America, A-levels in the UK, IB, everywhere, uh, internationally, uh, they generally teach things to a higher level than the DBS does. So just be aware that when you look up stuff online that um, the depth of knowledge they have on their courses can often cases be more depth than required for us, okay? But these are fairly current topical stuff. So these are nice lesson plans as you go on that you can look, um, for example, environmental problems, climate change is market failure, okay? So you can adapt that resource for the leaving cert there. So there's different fun ways of teaching the sustainability part of learning outcome 1.3 through the different parts of the course in strands two, three, and four, okay? Um, so there's various different uh, lesson plans there. As I say, some of them aren't, relevant to our course, some of them are great for it, um, you, you'll see yourself, okay? Uh, next up then is, this is a resource I love, okay? It's the, uh, the Economist Magazine's Educational Foundation, and these guys have a wonderful uh, weekly uh, email, okay? If you're not already signed up, I strongly encourage you to do. What it does is basically develop lesson plans on stuff that's topical and happening right now, okay? Uh, so each week, and this is a great one for TYs as well, by the way. Uh, in terms of giving them something fun and interesting that's happening, okay? So they, full, uh, they have a weekly learning resource and they have all the back catalog of it as well. So there's where you can sign up. You'll, have, you'll get the link with the presentation. There's the link to sign up to the emails, okay? And yeah, okay, it's another spam email that you get each week, but it's really good uh, stuff, okay? So the stuff about the news cycle, okay? So what's happening in the news, okay? So this week's resource is about the COVID-19 vaccine. Really relevant, all about economics, and um, there's lots of different stuff and here's all the old stuff so they have it split down into different categories here okay so there's loads of covid related resources there and i mean there are full lesson packs there's lesson plans there's videos there's worksheets and uh, there's various different stuff there where it's literally it's ready made for you it's tailor made for you just bring it into your classroom okay and um, it can be great when a student asks you a question about oh for example covid19 and trump you know what i mean um ask you about that uh, ask you about it and you're like oh it'd be nice to do a lesson on it but where do i even start there is so much, it's such a wealth of information here. And um, obviously enough, um, we can't do all of it all the time. Um, but they can be really nice lessons if you want to have a nice topical lesson. Because one of the key things about the course is that it's taking what we have and making it relevant, uh, taking the content there, it's making it relevant to the students and their day-to-day -day stuff. So it's not a case of regurgitating facts, uh, like the, the definitions anymore. It's taking the definitions and applying their knowledge to different uh, examples, okay? Um, wrong way. Here we go. And now the last present uh, one I'm going to show you here is Core, Eco uh, Core Economics. Core Economics, as it currently stands, is a fantastic resource. There's lots of great notes in it. It's more designed for, um, at, at currently is currently designed for third level in many cases. Um, there are some second level resources, and there's more coming on stream. But there's great explainers there, uh, and that is currently taking a very long time to load, um, which is meaning I'm stalling here for a second. But there is some wonderful resources there that you can take and you'll see yourself where okay that's how much i need to know and this stuff thereafter i don't need to know but let's say for example if a student's off um and is off sick for whatever reasons especially now with covid and people off isolated whatever and you want to set them work to do to be able to learn at home themselves there is great great resources here there's great videos um and it's all very step by step the key thing with core uh, econ basically is that it's, uh, it's been con the content's constantly being updated. So when they teach, say, supply demand and elasticity on this, they're not teaching in the textbook sense that we're used to, they're teaching it in the context of what's happening in the news and the world around us now. So this is constantly being updated all the time uh, for what's happening at the moment. So it can be very good to even for us to go in and get ideas as to current and relevant examples as to what's happening at the moment and how, how can we teach this in a good, relevant and fun way, okay? And if you want to be a bit cross-curricular, there is, um, some different uh, stuff there as well. Okay, so that is that there. So that there are some different uh, resources there. How are we on time? We are ah, oh, we're we're, a little, we're we're doing very well on time. Okay, um, so just a quick recap on some of the stuff and say we're looking mostly at Strand uh, Unit One Point One and basically building a foundation in economics. Okay, so you know yourself in your first two weeks back. 
we're giving we're hitting all the students up to a certain base level that they have a basic understanding before you hit the ground running with wherever you're going to actually start your course with be it demand or maybe a bit of macro or something else and um, so the zoo game to explain scarcity so they get the idea that we have to make choices that we can't get everything we want in life and um, little activity of an opportunity cost if you want to one there little activities on factors of production so you're not dwelling on it you're just giving a little idea of an introduction as to what each of the factors of production are okay production possibility curve the game for that so they understand what it is and what the context of that is uh, and how that we use our resources to make different uh, goods and the choice that have to be made there. Uh, introduction to sustainability um, so that we're not spending forever on it. We're giving the students good background so that when we delve into the course that we can find ways of incorporating links of that into it. Okay, so I think it's now it's time for questions, if there's any questions left. So uh, Lisa, do we have any more questions? There is only one question in and it says, I feel like I'm very behind with current six years just wondering, is that okay, given the current circumstances? Okay. Again, I have no ties to the department at all, okay? So I have no insider information on that at all. But I think, to be fair, uh, I would speculate um, that the, the, you're, you're probably not alone, you know what I mean? And I'm sure in the fullness of time um, that there may, or there may be some accommodation in, for the current fifth years, but who knows what they'll be, who knows when we'll find out, um that's that's not for us mere mortals to know and um, we will no doubt be told um in due course as they say mm -hmm. i mean I'm, I'm not teaching economics this year but I, I do find like for my current second years i feel like i'm very behind uh for business and my first years i'm a little bit behind as well and with my current fifth years i'm just a tiny bit maybe a chapter or two off where i would normally be so i think given everything you know contact time and everything probably okay to be a little bit behind. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, but yeah, I agree. Um, I suppose is anyone else? Oh, there's another question in there. Hang on, AJ. Excellent. I'm uh, so sorry about the dog. He's so unprofessional. I <laughs> have pronounced managers in their life with a dog, but here we are. Um, this is from an anonymous person. So it says, what is your approach for the research project and any tips? Just before James answers that, James, I don't know if you guys know this, but James did a talk with us back in, was it September, James, or October? Yeah, it was October, November. Yeah, right October, yeah. November time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he did it via Zoom. It was actually one of the first events we held of the year. And that is up on the BSTI YouTube um, channel. And he spoke at length about um, the research project. It was, it was specifically on the research project. So if you want to check that out, you can check it out there as well. Sorry, James, do you want to answer that question? No, no problem at all. I, I was going to say, yeah, I think probably the best thing to do is that because that's recorded there, the resources that were used are all that there. So the, probably the best thing to look at that. The key thing to remember, though, is that that research project was for the, the, the class of 2021. We don't know what the class of 2022 are getting it. OK, so just to be very aware that they will have their own different question, um, so to speak. So. Um, there's some general stuff, tips you can take from that in terms of different approaches you can take, but otherwise it's a real case of let's wait and see what we get from the department in the new year. Any other questions there, folks, while we're... Yeah, does anyone want to post any questions? Just again, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I put the um, Google Drive link to the document for the uh, attendance, search of attendance in the chat function. So if you want to check it out there, um, yeah, you can pull it down from there. And if there's any issues, just DM me or you can email me or something. And yeah, any more questions there as well? Either I, one of two things has happened. Either we're completely frozen um, and they can't hear or see us, or <laughs> the and they're very happy with what they've seen. I'm hoping it's the latter, but... I think it is. I think you've given them so many amazing techniques there. I was even thinking like if I did have an economics class, I think some of the activities that you gave there would be amazing just to take a class to revise and kind of make it fun towards the end of the year um, and stuff like that. I think they're they're relevant for everybody. It's incredible. Thank you. You're very welcome. As I say, now, as I say we're focusing very much on strand one there and there's lots of different other games activities that we can do in strand two, three and four uh, as it were. So don't think that's it. There is more stuff we can do, but just give you, you know, give you a flavor to think about over the summer or even as part of your vision now uh, with the last few weeks as were. Um, or as well, um, little, all those, by the way, you can easily do with TYs. You know, and especially this time of year, TYs at the moment, I'm not sure about you guys, but my TYs are 
gone. You know, they're done. They're finished. Exactly. So <laughs> trying to trying to do anything to keep them in any way engaged or somewhat tied to their chair is a challenge. So um, yeah, there we go. Um, thanks so many me. people are saying like great and thank, thank you, you and and everything. Um, if no one has any more, like James and I will stay on for a few minutes. But if anyone has any more, I don't want to hold up any anybody for any longer than we than we have to. Um, but yeah so again it will be it has been recorded it'll be up on the bsti youtube channel um in the next couple of days um the james is going to share the um the powerpoint with me and i will um share it with you guys or rachel will share it with you um when you when we get it and again the search of attendance is in the chat function not the q a the chat function um, but yeah, other than that, thank you guys. Thank you, James, so much. And thank you to everybody who has logged on this evening and logged on um, all of the other evenings as well. We're very grateful for all the support and Rolo is too. Um, thank you so much. And we'll stay on if anyone has any questions or anything. But thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you for having me. And uh, no thank problem. you for leaving with us uh, for this as well. Hope you enjoyed it. And thank you very much. <laughs> I think I might... Are you still recording? Or? I think I'm going to stop recording. Yeah. Uh,